Hello viewers, welcome to BharatShakti.in. I am Brigadier Chatterjee, editor BharatShakti.in. Today we are going to be discussing about the 1971 Indo-Pakistan War, also known as the Liberation of Bangladesh War. It remains a historical landmark in our region's geopolitical construct. The Pakistani army had let loose a degree of tyranny rarely witnessed in the history of this region. Thousands of refugees were crossing into India every day when Mrs. Gandhi decided to go in for a walk. By then, the revolting Bangladeshis had organized themselves into a militant resistance movement and Mukti Bahini had been born. Field Marshal Sam Manikra, then the Chief of Army Staff, advised Mrs. Gandhi to give him time to prepare for the Indian forces to be ready to go to war. He was ready to launch the offensive only when he was ready for it. Meanwhile, as the Indian forces equipped themselves, India launched its diplomatic offensive. On the 3rd December, Pakistanis launched a preemptive airstrike to gain the initiative. The war had already started now leading finally to the fall of Dhaka and over 90,000 Pakistani prisoners of war. I have with me two very eminent guests today. Uh, they are Lieutenant General P.R. Shankar. He has been the Director General Artillery and currently he is a professor in the Aerospace Department of IIT Chennai. I also have with me General Harsha Kakkar. He is a strategic analyst, a prolific writer, he is a member, in fact, the founder member of a think tank in Lucknow, Strive. Welcome, both of you, gentlemen. Right. My first issue is, uh, well, it's directed at General Harsha Ayu. Uh, give us a little bit of the backdrop, the geopolitical strategy at the national level. Uh, let me also clarify it over here, that we will restrict ourselves only to the big issues, the strategic issues, the operational issues. We will not go, go into the nitty gritties of various battles. Right. So, uh, General Harsha, the backdrop and the geopolitical strategy at the national level. What do you have to say about it? Thank you, Brigadier Chatterjee, sir. I think this is, a, this is an issue that we need to now put, put across to the nation, especially at a time when we are touching the 49th anniversary of this great event. The seeds for the war were laid almost at the time of partition itself. Pakistan refused to accept Bengali as a state language. Economic disparity between the two parts. The hegemony of the West Pakistani ruling elite over then East Pakistan. Martial law, demeaning attitude towards the Bengali culture and the population had soured the relations between the two parts right from then. In this particular matter, Tensions rose in December 17, when the Awami League, led by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, won the national elections. But West Pakistan parties, mainly the, People's Pakistan, the Pakistan People's Party, refused to hand over power. In March 71, using violence as an excuse, the Pakistani army intervened to stem the growth of nationalist sentiments in the East. It recruited local pro-Pakistan Bengalis and non-Bengalis, including the jamaat islami for its operations against Bengalis. As the violence escalated throughout the summer, a large number of refugees streamed into India. The government of India then decided on a two-track approach to resolve the then East Pakistan crisis. First was to support the liberation struggle, to exert pressure on Pakistan to respect the electoral verdict of 71. <clears throat> Second was to mobilize international public opinion through bilateral contacts and the UN. The first track was very well followed. The second track, there were many hurdles, mainly because of US support to Pakistan. New Delhi then had no option. It had to intervene militarily. And like you stated, war was declared when Pakistan attacked our airfields on 3rd December. 
It ended with the surrender of the Pakistan army on December 16. The death toll due to the bloodletting carried out by the Pak army is estimated to vary between 300,000 to, 3 to 3 million Bengalis, with hundreds of thousands of women raped. Now, when we come down to the Indian geopolitical strategy, initially, Manik Shah had planned to capture a few ports and some parts of East Pakistan and establish a government there. Subsequently, the plan changed. The emphasis shifted to an offensive operation in the East and a defensive strategy in the West. But coming down to the East, the final objective was Dhaka, the center of gravity and the geopolitical and geostrategic heart of East Pakistan. Pakistan fortified positions and towns were to be bypassed, and therefore the thrust lines were very carefully selected. Subsidiary objectives were selected in order to ensure that communication centers and command and control centers were destroyed. Enemy forces were bypassed. And in order to achieve the above, the aim was to draw Pakistan forces into towns and border areas leaving Dhaka and key areas lightly defended. Along with planning for operations in Bangladesh, India also had to cater for defense against any possible Chinese intervention, contain the insurgency in the Northeast, and secure the defense of Bhutan. This, uh, Brigadier Chatterjee, is the broad geopolitical plan as laid out by India. Uh, thank you so much. I think that was uh, very concisely given to us. Uh, let's go a little further. And uh, can I uh, request you, General Shankar, now? Well, uh, what I, uh, what my question is, uh, what was now, we've seen the national strategy. Now let's talk about the military strategy and let's take an overview, both the Western sector and the Eastern se sector. What was our overall military strategy as far as you're concerned? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think uh, Harsha put across things well. I'll take off from there. Uh, first and foremost, before we consider our military strategy, let me give a word about the Pakistan military strategy. Uh, Pakistan wanted to, uh, you know, win the war in the West. So they were all set for an offensive in the West. They wanted to preempt the whole issue and upset the Indian apple cart. Uh, as of course, they expected China to come and bail them out. And they wanted China to come and you know actually relieve pressure on Bangladesh. And uh, last but not the least, they were banking very heavily on US. And of course, US was also giving full support to them. That's a broad uh, Pakistani plot. Now, as far as we were concerned, as Harsha had said, uh, we were to hold the West and uh, prosecute uh, offensive in the East in Bangladesh. And of course, uh, we also had to guard against China and the Northeast, uh, you know, uh, instability out there, guard the Siliguri corridor and Bhutan, for which we used one division. I think it was six div. Uh, now, other than that, the broad strategy was to isolate the Bangladesh from the sea, from all around, and also decimate then wipe out the whatever air force they had. Uh, you know, little they had uh, in the East, so that you could get air dominance. But having said that, uh, like I'll just reinforce, we wanted to avoid strong points, uh, bypass, and get to the center at the uh, get to the center of the gravity at the earliest. Now for this, what was planned was we'll carry out a multi-pronged offensive, and these prongs were very carefully chosen. They actually went astride the river corridors. If you see. Uh, the thesis, they, you know, there were four prongs, the western prong, the northwestern prong, which came along the Tista River, the northeastern, which came along the Brahmaputra, and as it gets into Bangladesh, called the Padma and the Meghna, and then, of course, from the southeast, which came. Now, two core came from the west, that is the jasur kulna axis. Uh, from the north, 22 and 33 core came down. And the northeast was 101 area with newly formed uh, forces uh, came down along the, that corridor. And uh, along the east was uh, General Sagat Singh's uh, four corps, right? And 
uh, their entire aim was to you know move at the earliest use innovative means to cross over uh, into the heart of bangladesh right uh, considering the fact that we are in reverend terrain and then of course uh, part of the strategy was to use the mukti bahini in full force and leverage the value which mukti bahini was giving us uh, to uh, you know get to the heart of dhaka all this was to be done uh, at top speed in fact it was a blitzkrieg operation it's a blitzkrieg not seen since second world war and if i look back in history and see the uh, you know the end result if i am a prem the whole thing i think this blitzkrieg was out of uh, you know history though the westerners don't say it i think this is the most successful blitzkrieg in military blitzkrieg in history because this was one blitzkrieg which ended in not only in victory it created a nation right that's the importance of this whole thing uh, yeah this is what i had to say about the overall military strategy we'll discuss other things as we go along uh, right uh, uh, gel asha back to you uh, he talked a little bit about of course uh, the strategy part of military strategy part of it as also operational plan can i ask you to elaborate a little more or talk about operational plans as you view them and if you could just touch upon tangail i think that's uh, uh, going to be a very interesting thing as far as my, our viewers are concerned if you look at the terrain in east pakistan it is divided by three rivers the ganges the brahmaputra and the meghna river sectors now these river systems divide the area into four sectors as general shankar had explained and he had put across the four levels the plans were made once the plans had been determined as to which routes to take then eastern command began working out on what were the force levels needed what did they have and what did they actually require it turned out they needed three additional divisions if they were to push through in the manner in which general shankar very clearly and concisely put it across and they were allotted three additional divisions 9 4 and 23 then there was a requirement at the initial stages that they will need a parachute brigade and this is something initially they were they were looking for a heli for a heliborn come parachute division but then that was not there and they finally got a parachute brigade and this is what they needed to be able to push through around and they knew it will come into play especially when you're going to cross the major rivers now not only the operations the fact was that once you've planned operations you had to cater for additional construct for construction improvement of roads capacities of railroads they had to be increased landing grounds had to be constructed all these had to come as close to the border as possible signal centers and communication requirements were there <coughs> all this is moving at full steam a major benefit which came out right in the initial stages was the indian air force achieving air dominance and mastery of the skies over east pakistan in just the first two days of the war now this itself created the much desired operational space the five division strong land force to advance in from three different directions bypass pakistani fortifications headed for the ferries and bridges in the rear secure choke points all was done unhindered by the park air force the air domination also ensured enforcement of the naval blockade a successful amphibious assault in cox bazar and now you come down to what you and what you were just mentioning today in 1971 was the famous battalion group at tangail effectively altered the entire military arithmetic, arithmetic on ground an incredible feat 12 small mi4 helicopters of the air force ferried a brigade strong force across the 2 km wide meghna river it was actually inflicting shock and awe on the pakistani defenders silat was captured through heliborn operations and all through you had the resolute support of the mukti bahini which ensured that everything went through absolutely in time because the intelligence inputs coming to you the deployment of force levels the correct access to be taken all flowed 
from Mukti Bahini who were locals well aware. And finally was the highly accurate rocket attack on the governor's house. It was this that signaled time for you to resign and hasten the surrender of the 93,000 soldiers who were there in Bangladesh. Well, thank you. I think that's a very nice way of explaining the whole thing. So I suppose it's I primarily a speed, shock, action, and well, surprise. That's what uh, perhaps uh, really good. won us the day. Uh, let's go a little further, uh, and we'll talk about the Indian Air Force now. I have a guest uh, with me from the Air Force, and let me get on to him. Air Marshal Arjun Subramaniam. Uh, Arjun Subramaniam is a author, military historian. He's also a mentor and academic advisor to the National Defense College and an adjunct faculty with the Naval War College. Uh, welcome to Bharat Shakti. Dot in. Uh, Air Marshal. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Well, just to give you a little bit of a preamble before we go on to our questions, uh, I would say that the Indian Air Force had a very stellar role in the 1971 operations, both in the Western Theatre as also in the Eastern Theatre. Uh, the pace of the battle wouldn't have been the same, especially in Bangladesh, had it not been for the Air Force which dominated the skies fully. I would refer to, in fact, Tangail Paradrop in particular and its consequent effect on the morale of uh, Pakistani commanders in East Pakistan. It could barely have been possible for the Paradrop to be attempted you know, in that size without the Indian Air Force dominating the sky. So, keeping that in view, uh, my question to you, A. Marshal, is what was the Indian Air Force's overall st strategy? What major resources did the Indian Air Force have to operate for this strategy to be executed? Uh, you know, Brigadier Chatterjee, there are two things that I wanted to uh, emphasize on right up front. That the Indian Air Force embarked on a very steep learning curve after the 1965 war. And uh, the one person responsible for that steep learning curve being translated into operational preparedness in the 1971 war was its cerebral air chief, air chief marshal P.C. La. And as a historian, it is my uh, assessment that probably air chief marshal P.C. Lal uh, was the most far-sighted and cerebral air chief that the Indian Air Force has ever had. Now, he had a ringside view of operations as the vice chief in 1965. And therefore, he realized that he needed to put a lot of things in place if the Indian Air Force wanted to be a critical linchpin of joint operations, both in the eastern and the western sectors. Let's look at airfields. Uh, the Indian Air Force had nine airfields around the Bangladesh theater of operations. It had numerous airfields in the western sector, but also added on three airfields in the desert sector, which is Jaisalmer, Uttarlai, and Nal. And this was in order to beef up India's offensive defense posture on the western front. If you recollect, the Indian Air Force had been taken by surprise in 1965. Air Chief Marshal Lal ensured that he put in place a very robust air defense network, particularly on the West, wherein we far outnumbered the Pakistanis in terms of radars available. For the first time, MOPs were deployed, which is the mobile observation posts. And this ensured that when the Pakistanis struck on 3rd December, the Indian Air Force was ready. And uh, not more than 30 to 40 sorties of the Pakistan Air Force got through because of the robust air defense response. The other element of preparedness, uh, which entirely can be attributed to Air Chief Marshal Lal, was the uh, improvement in stocks of ammunition, uh, procurement of different kind of aerial delivery weapons from the Soviet Union, and the upgrading of platforms like the Hunter the MiG and the, uh, and the Canberra. Uh, quickly, let me put it, in the Western sector, uh, the Indian Air Force's strategy was offensive defense uh, with uh, uh, with not so much emphasis on striking Pakistani uh, targets deep inside, though, of course, a number of strikes were carried out. But it was offensive defense, robust air defense, supporting the Indian Army, both in interdiction and in uh, close air support operations. On the east, of course, the strategy was completely different. The Indian Air Force had an overwhelming superiority in numbers, 12 squadrons vis-a-vis -vis the Pakistan Air Force's one squadron. So the first aim of the Indian Air Force was to achieve complete air superiority. 
Next was to carry out interdiction, close air support. And the one uh, aspect of air operations in the East, which emerged for the first time, was this whole concept of vertical envelopment. You mentioned the Tangail drop, but even before the Tangail drop, the IAF's extensive fleet of Mi-4 and, and uh, uh, Chetak helicopters were used successfully by Lieutenant General Sagat Singh in vertical envelopment, both at Narshindi as well as in uh, Silet. We had the we had the Heliborn operation across the Meghna, never done, never done before. And, and all this actually was a result of some extremely robust strategizing before the war commenced and the period of those six or seven months that were available. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Imarshan. Uh, you know, our focus today is a little bit more on Bangladesh. So can I ask you to dwell on uh, Air Force operations in Bangladesh in particular? Okay. Uh, you know, the nine airfields uh, uh, in the Eastern Theater were all so arranged so that they could provide adequate support to all the three army corps that were going in, including 101 Communication Zone. You had airfields like Agartala and Guwahati supporting four corps. You had uh, airfields like uh, uh, Hashimara and, and the others supporting, uh, uh, you know, 33 core and two core operations. You had Agartala. Uh, so, so these nine airfields, all of them, including Panagad, including Dum Dum, they were all exploited for offensive air operations. Number one. Number two uh, is that the first aim of the Indian Air Force in Bangladesh was to achieve complete air superiority. And that it had to do by ensuring that the sole uh, Sabre squadron was completely neutralized. Now, that took a few days to achieve. You know, uh, in the initial days, the Indian Air Force was still searching for the right weapon to hit Tezgao airfield. And then finally, the MiG-21s did the trick on, on, on the 6th or the 7th of December. And after that, it was a cakewalk for the Indian Air Force because, uh, you know, uh, if I'm not wrong, number 14 squadron, uh, which was uh, the Sabre squadron, uh, was completely neutralized. The aircraft, I think, were, were flown away. Uh, the pilots went away to West Pakistan and a complete air superiority was achieved. The second thing which the Indian Air Force did, which, which I thought uh, you know, should have come first, was that from November 22nd onwards, from November 21st onwards, uh, the Indian Air Force was quite active, even though war was not declared on the Western Front. But the Indian Army, if you recollect, went into enclaves in East Pakistan. And by the time war broke out, actually, the Indian Army had control over several enclaves. And it is in one of those enclaves, which is Boira, uh, that the Nats shot down, uh, you know, Nats from Kalaikonda uh, operating from Dum Dum. Uh, shot down uh, sabers who were carrying out close air support against the Indian uh, uh, against the Indian Army, uh, and then we talked about interdiction against Jamalpur uh, in Silet, uh, deployment of forward air controllers, very very effective. You know, I've written in my book about a young flight lieutenant Sharma who was a transport pilot was with uh, General Cardozo uh, and his unit in Silet, and uh, the one battalion fighting against a brigade. A lot of air support from the Nats were given. Uh, to the Silet operations. So, so I would say all in all, uh, the air operations in Bangladesh leading right up to that, uh, you know, decisive blow, the strike by MiG-21s and hunters on the governor's residence actually was the last straw that broke the camel's back. When you combine the psychological impact of that airstrike, along with the ongoing impact of the, uh, of the Tangail airdrop, and incidentally, you know, viewers would uh, would be interested uh, to know that 50 transport aircraft from the Indian Air Force participated in the Tangail drop. And not just uh, transport aircraft, but also fighter aircraft comprising of Nats and MiG-21s escorting that entire formation. Uh, and the psychological impact was such that actually the Pakistanis thought that a whole brigade had been dropped. Whereas actually it was, you know, the force was just over the, over a battalion strength. Uh, that was dropped uh, at Tangail. Uh, so so uh, almost every mission that the Indian Air Force had trained for in the preceding years was employed in Bangladesh. Close air support, interdiction, reconnaissance, uh, vertical envelopment, strategic strikes. So so uh, what, what you're saying is absolutely right. Uh, the Air Force, uh, I think what the Air Force did was, was it shaped the environment that led to the collapse uh, you know, of Niazi's forces in, in uh, Pakistan, in East Pakistan. 
let me just uh, share with you a little bit uh, that I know about the Tamil drop and because you called it a brigade drop and that's how they visualized it. You know what happened in Delhi, the uh, PRO, he walked up to the press and he gave them a chit that there's a brigade which has been dropped there in Tangail. Whether it was an error or whether it was information operations, psychological operations, nobody is really aware of it. But the fact of it is the Doodarshan went gaga over it, the brigade has been dropped. And that had a tremendous impact. Forget about a bedan being dropped, that itself has so much of an impact, and here was the whole brigade. Anyway, thank you, uh, Emerson. Thank you so much for giving, giving us your time and uh, such a beautiful explanation of what's happened both on the Western and also on the Bangladesh front, I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Brig Richard. <clears throat> Great being on the show. Let's get the naval view now. Today on our platform, we also have another guest, uh, Rear Admiral S. Srikhande. Uh, he's a sailor, writer, erudite speaker, teaches operational art and leadership in various institutions. Uh, but before I welcome him, just a little bit of a preamble. The Navy had a stellar role to play in the 1971 operations. The most remarkable, I would say, of all that they did then was the attack on Karachi Highway, Harbour. It was also the first time in our independent history that the Navy was blooded in war and came out with flying colors. Admiral Srikande, welcome to Bharat Shakti uh, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, let's start with uh, the questions. I have uh, two questions, in fact, uh, from you. Uh, the first one is, what was the naval strategy really in, within the I would say constraints or within the framework of the greater national and military strategy. Um, as far as naval operations are concerned, the 1971 war in both theaters, the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, and in the southern Indian Ocean or, you know, or in the Indian Ocean itself around Sri Lanka, uh, provide sort of great examples of for robustness, tactical proficiency, and achievements of several strategic objectives. Uh, that the smart use of sea power brings to overall strategic success as it did in 1971. Um, it also demonstrated that sea power ultimately serves the achievement of uh, influencing events on land. And in this case, uh, sea power achieved the bottling up uh, uh, and, and the throttling of sea lines of communications, uh, both in East Pakistan as well as West Pakistan, of doing it via via uh, depending on uh, the situations via sea control uh, sea denial and uh, power projection um, as as missions for the navy and uh, uh, on the eastern front uh, you know it 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 coincided with the unlimited obje national objective of a regime change which was the defeat of the east pakistani rule leading to the liberation of bangladesh and the establishment of their own rule as a sovereign nation uh, which also dictated that the main naval objectives were in the Bay of Bengal of blockading the east coast of Pakistan, preventing any ingress and egress of men and material through sea routes around Sri Lanka. There was therefore a coherence to the overall naval strategies in both the west and the east, as well as the almost ignored southern theater. And yet, while the success, I mean ignored by historians, I would say, uh, and yet while the success was almost complete, there are still lessons to celebrate as well as to learn what not to do. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me get on to my next question. And, you know, there's some interesting battles during the uh, operations. And what comes to my mind most, uh, let's say, battles, or you can call, call operations, just, well, uh, the, the Ghazi sinking, the Pakistani submarine, so famous a submarine in those days, Ghazi sinking, which was one of the major strengths. And the second one is the Indian Navy's raid on the Karachi Harbour. Can you throw some light on both these issues? Uh, the first, of course, is Ghazi then. Uh, Ghazi was a long-range American submarine of the Tench class, built and commissioned, in fact, at the end of the Second World War. If I remember, just, just a few weeks before the Second World War concluded, or a few months. She was sailed by the Pakistanis with the intention of operating in the Bay of Bengal uh, with the primary objective of sinking the loan carrier INS Vikrant and other fleet units if possible. Uh, I think by the third week of November, the Indian Navy had signal intelligence that she was in the Bay of Bengal and likely to operate off Vishakhapatnam uh, by, uh, uh, for uh, uh, laying mines off the harbor and for intercepting any fleet units or both missions. Uh, so. 
uh, as it happened the destroyer rajput detected a contact around midnight of 2nd or 3rd october or uh, uh, december uh, 1971 and fired a pattern of depth charges thereafter louder explosions were recorded and debris from the submarine was found at first light and there was initial confirmation that this was the ghazi uh, whether whether the ghazi was actually destroyed by the depth charge attack or if there was an internal explosion uh, caused due to hydrogen build up of the batteries or it was a mine that exploded in the process of laying has never been conclusively established what is conclusively be established that the ghazi did sink off visakhapatnam harbor and so she lies to date there um, she was firstly by by her sinking she was no no longer a threat to the eastern naval command uh, the official announcement i think was made on the 9th of december for a few reasons however the absence of ghazi enabled several things first it enabled vikrant to carry out the roles of sea strikes uh, from from the sea on onto shore targets now Vikrant was a light carrier with limited numbers of aircraft. Her speed was also restricted because she had a bad boiler, and this meant that there were times when she could not even launch planes due to low wind on deck conditions. Also, instrumental in her operating with impunity in highly asymmetric conditions, not different from the way U.S. carriers have operated for decades in West Asia in asymmetric situations. Um, uh, was was the total air superiority that the Indian Air Force had achieved? over east pakistan and the actions by mukti bhaini and indian divers as commandos in destroying several merchant ships and petrol craft as well so the submarine was the main threat to the carrier group uh, and coincidentally the submarine itself or submarines became the main worry for the us navy's enterprise carrier group sent to flex muscle quite unsuccessfully as it turned out uh, because india was not impressed by that demonstration um, but what the soviets had done as records and publication show including by dobrinin i think that they had intentionally exposed a few of their nuclear submarines in the indian ocean region to warn the americans of the threat that their nuclear submarines could pose to the carrier group so uh, the, this was what i think the ghazi achieved or the sinking of the ghazi achieved uh, prior, directly and indirectly Uh, let's get on to the Karachi thing, and if you can keep it a little brief, we are a little short of time. On the western seaboard, several operations took place, and I mention only the the, the Karachi raids uh, because they were boldly conceived and executed missile attacks against shore and some land targets by anti-ship missiles fired by the OSA class missile boats on the fourth and ninth of December. The first attack destroyed uh, the their Pakistani destroyer Khaybar, the minesweeper Muhafiz, and a Liberian tanker. as well as at least one oil tank amidst much confusion and also due to attacks by the indian air force on karachi most surface ships were recalled by the pakistani navy into their harbor by 8th of december and the 9th of 8th and 9th december the western fleet struck again with missile boats the pakistani navy tanker was damaged dhaka was damaged as were two merchant ships one of which was sunk and one damaged and the fourth missile uh, created damage ashore once again overall these attacks were noteworthy for the physical damage they created for the consequent impact on pakistan navy's cautious uh, cautions including deamunitioning ships to the minimum and on hardly being of consequence for the remainder of the war so psychologically also these attacks were a great success had there been better planning and coordination between the air force and the indian navy perhaps the results of both services would have been much greater it is not for nothing that the 4th of december is celebrated therefore as navy day and having commanded a successor class of missile boats as a lieutenant commander 22 years later uh, i have always felt part of that kindred spirit of those officers and men who came to call themselves the killer squadron there there are of course details of the operations which hold lessons for success as well as inadequacies but these could be discussed some other day so that's all i have to thank you so much thank you so much i'm sure uh, karachi harbor raid was is remain So it does remain a great inspiration for naval officers, for naval all ranks. In fact, it remains an inspiration for all of us who have ever put on a uniform. Thank you for such a nice uh, explanation uh, of this. Thank you very much. Well, Jan Shankar, now my next question is to you, and this is uh, of course uh, uh, something beyond the borders, really. Uh, you see, Mukti Bhaini, I think, played a very major role, a very substantive role, I would say. as far as these operations are concerned so uh, how was mukti bhaini really uh, initially trained and thereafter utilized if you could give us some details 
Yeah, uh, Mukti Bahini, I think, uh, you know, was a great uh, lever in the defeat of uh, East Pakistan or Pakistan forces. Uh, let's first and foremost, the Mukti Bahini initially used to be called the Mukti Forge, and then later it became the Mukti Bahini. You know, actually, as uh, refugees started flowing from uh, Bangladesh in May, you know, so did the Mukti <laughs> Forge at that point started getting formed. And it started getting formed, you know, on the backbone of a lot of deserters, including officers from the Pakistan army, right? And uh, what is now known to many is that a lot of these Mukti Bahini operations commenced right before the before December, three four months before December, uh, you know, and the Indian Armed Forces were also training them, uh, getting coordinated with them. And a lot of training was not needed, really, because many of them were deserters and were trained by the Pakistanis themselves. So we just had to coordinate, get our bearings straight, and conduct cross-border operations <coughs> well before uh, you know December. As a result, a lot of subversion was be- going on, a lot of sabotage was going on, a lot of recce was going on, and we were getting ground intelligence we were getting disposition of troops. And I think when we entered Bangladesh, you know, a lot of groundwork had been done by uh, Mukti Bahini. Now, if you enumerate what they had done, let's look at it. I mean, there was something like the resistance force, you know. After we are looking at an era just two uh, decades after the Second World War, and the resistance model of the French resistance and the European resistance was still there. And the Mukti Bahini followed that model really speaking. And then they, they mentally, that was a construct those days. Intelligence. You know, Mukti Bahini could pinpoint where Pakistanis were, where the reserves were, where their uh, guns were, where their everything was there, and where there were holes. You know, where there were nothing which we could get a safe pass- passage to. I think that was uh, very important. The second thing where they helped us was in mobility. You wouldn't have achieved all this mobility but for the fact that these people knew the ground and could guide us through in that riverine terrain. Look, uh, it's December. The rivers are not that fast flowing in that part. It's not so boggy, but still it is riverine. And for those of us who operated there, and I've been in 20 Dev in my younger days and done riverine operation, it's still tough. At that time, these people led our forces through uh, that area. And they enabled tanks to go through. Though, of course, we were only talking of P-76, PT-76 tanks, but we could go through. Then, of course, uh, sabotage, subversion, I think was very important. Logistics. They could round up locals and provide logistics. They were very important in you know, designating airfields in depth. For example, even in Tangail, you know, the, the path breakers and the pathfinders were assisted by Mukti Bahini on the ground to mark out airfields, to put out, light up uh, DZs and all that, right? And of course, the local support which they generated. In the whole process of doing so, they isolated Pakistanis. The Pakistanis were bereft of local support. I think that's a very, very, very major thing which today, you know, is important. And if I may add, and you know, the Pakistanis have tried to do the same thing to us in JNK without success. That's the difference, right? Uh, we ha- we actually had, uh, they helped us win the hearts and minds of Bangladeshis. Uh, that's something which is gold, you know, in such kind of operations. Uh, this is what I had, yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, please, no, go ahead. The, the, uh, all yours. No, actually, what I want to say is I've had two experiences in my service, one while serving in Sukhna and one while in Calcutta, to interact closely with the Mukti Bahini veterans when they come down on their uh, visit to India, especially around this period. It's such a pleasure meeting them because they talk with great fondness the period of their training, the involvement of the Indian officers with them, and they know the names of all the officers who were involved with their training, with their guidance, and they keep inquiring as to where they are. So normally, 
you have to then get back into records, find out as to where they are. They're very keen to get in touch because for them, the sort of coordination or the sort of uh, oneness of operations between the Indian Army and the Mukti Bahini possibly uh, would be far more than we looked even at the resistance fighters and the allied forces when they landed in Europe. Because here it was working together, being trained by them, being, you know, I mean, equipped by them. And then when you're operating, you're being guided by them all through in your manner of actions, in your operations. So that sort of a bonding which grew. And with us and the Bangladeshi celebrating uh, Vijay Divas together with a smaller Indian contingent going to Bangladesh and a larger Bangladesh contingent coming to India, especially to uh, the Eastern Command headquarters in Calcutta. We are continuing with the spirit of uh, permanent engagement with the Mukti Bahini, which I think is a very good step and we should continue with it. I'm so glad both of you, between the two of you, brought out this aspect of uh, Mukti Bhaini, both the operational side of it and the human side of it so well. Uh, I guess when you fight together, when you into operations together, you develop a bond which lasts your lifetime. And maybe that's the same story that I'm hearing from both of you. Uh, to go a little further, uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, the one last issue and I'll request both of you to join me with your comments on the issue. And the issue is about what is this big strategic advantage, what are the other advantages that has accrued as far as we are concerned, having gone into a war <coughs> with Pakistan, having suffered whatever casualties we have suffered, having well, spent as much of uh, money as was required to win the war uh, at the end of the day. Did we really achieve any big advantages? I think this is a stupendous victory, first and foremost. You know, the, the, the josh of that victory, uh, which uh, I don't, is unparalleled in history. Like I said, we created a nation, right? And exited that place. So the prestige of India went up. But I will put it in a different manner. I mean, that they, these are all things. Let, let me look at it from a contra point of view. What would it be if we still had East Pakistan? Right? Harsha will talk of uh, the other things, but I'll look at it from a negative point of view. If East Pakistan had been there today, right, then that Siliguri corridor would have been totally critical. And look at it. East Pakistan there and Doklam happening where would India have been? So, right. Second, if East Pakistan had continued like West Pakistan and emerged with radical Islamism, what would be the effect on uh, Northeast? Then, of course, what would China have done? Because now they want South Tibet, X, Y, Z. Okay. If East Pakistan had continued, then China would have got a direct naval entry into the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal. People don't realize that. They would be sitting in Jitagong and Cox's Bazar. They wouldn't be now trying to get a port through Myanmar and CMEC and all that. So, when you look at this victory of what we did in Bangladesh, apart from the peace dividend, a lot of people can talk what they want. But I think what happened really is that it maintained the integrity of India. The integrity of India would not have been there but for this victory. India would have been struggling, right, with uh, uh, from all around in the east and the north, vulnerable, right? So I. I, I leave it at that and I'll ask, request Harsha to take on the other aspects, the positive aspects of the whole affair. No, I quite agree with you, the, Shankar. Absolutely agree with you. I mean, the kind of advantages that we've had, we can leave one border completely free. We haven't got to maintain an operational readiness state for immediate deployment on that border also. I'm just talking about the border between us and Bangladesh. That itself is a, a huge accrual from all this. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, whatever be our expenditure or whatever be our effort for having liberated Bangladesh. Uh, now, Asha, all yours. Frankly, to a large extent, uh, 
what Shankar has said is absolute reality. And we never thought about it in 71 when we went through the operations. And what Shankar said, I want to add just one sentence before I move forward. Had East Pakistan remained, China's string of pearls would have been fully established by now and we'd have been in major, major problems. In fact, our expenditure on defense would have been so high that our economy would have been shaken by now. But look at the positivity. Militarily, it was our finest moment. <laughs> it was our professionalism, the integration between military, diplomacy, political, everything together. It showed the, the morale of our forces. Whichever way you want to term it, it shattered the morale of the Park Army. And a serious loss on their strategic assets, their naval ships, their air power, everything got affected, which is yet to be made up. It wiped off from our memory 1962 and the limited gains of 1965. Of course, the major, major disadvantage, we did not politically, especially during the negotiations, really gain advantage from the military benefit that we had in the 71 war. There's another small negative side to it. Pakistan will always remain an enemy of ours. There is no way it will ever change. And now, with East Pakistan having gone, its forces are now a viable and cohesive force, which is far more capable of defending a smaller nation than by defending both sides. And basically, uh, for us, we are going to have a perpetual Pakistan on our border. With Bangladesh, the only disadvantage which has been, has been the political shift within the country. If you have a government which is pro-India, you would find a major benefit for us, especially when we are dealing with our insurgencies and these issues in the Northeast. But if you have a government which is anti-India, you suddenly find bases coming up within Bangladesh for the insurgent groups. You find a new problem coming in, which is something which we need to handle. But the best part of everything is, that the India-Bangladesh armed forces are still together, fairly close. And the fact is that as long as the Bangladesh armed forces provide stability to the nation, we will always find a lot of positivity flowing through us, to us through Bangladesh. And I think that is a very good sign. So in the overall manner, though we've gained a lot, but there have been both sides, we've also lost. The major loss of ours, I would say, has been on our political front by not taking full advantage of the military victory which Bangladesh offered and the 93,000 prisoners of war which Indira Gandhi gave away for nothing. Right. Uh, thank you. I guess uh, we're running a bit out of uh, time also. And I think it was a wonderful discussion. Thank you, both of you uh, gentlemen. And thank you, viewers. Thank you for being with Bharat Shakti Dotten. We come out with these interesting episodes now and then. So, so do stay tuned in. Thank you, General Shankar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General Tucker. Thank you, sir.